Well, good evening. I'm doing my live video Facebook 4. I've spoken on a video about pacemakers and how to put a pacemaker in. And if you've seen it, those watching, I use my model heart here and uh, I put some leads into the various chambers. Now, it's difficult to do this and talk with you at the same time, but just to remind you, there's the chambers of the heart and you can have a look on the recorded video. So we've got the left ventricle and the right ventricle. And at the top, we've got the right atrium. And if you remember these two parts, then this is important because this is involved with putting in a pacemaker. So if we just start with some basics, uh, why might it be that you will need a pacemaker? Patients will come to a doctor and say, I fainted. That's an easy story. Uh, why did you faint? That's the difficult part. There's lots of reasons why you might faint. It could be a simple faint, what we call a vasovagal faint, where something triggers a drop in your blood pressure or a slowing of your heart rate. And that might happen if you have pain or if you have um, an illness which causes a change in your metabolism. It could be due to something being very hot or you being dehydrated. And rather like guards on parade, soldiers standing for ages, they can faint. So you can have a faint that's due to a change in the blood pressure, which drops, and then the circulation can't keep the oxygen to the brain. And normally what happens is you have a blackout or some warning, and the eyes, which are very sensitive to oxygen and the retina, uh, your vision comes in like a tunnel, and then it goes black, and then you can collapse if you don't sit down or lay down quickly. Now, at other times it can happen without that warning, and then people can be um, quite sort of worried about it because they may injure themselves. Now, I've got a, a message to say that somebody wants to join my broadcast, which I hope that Phil Hollington is joining it. And uh, we're, we're adding you now, Phil, so hopefully you'll see us. The other cause of uh, fainting might be something more serious. So there may be a problem with the circuits in the heart, the conduction from the top to the bottom. And that means that you have failure to get the signal from the natural pacemaker in the right atrium. And that was in this chamber here at the top, which we looked at in the video, if you've seen it before. And there's a group of cells here which trigger at a higher rate than those in the lower chambers and further down. So the heart will fire off at different rates as you go further down. So if you go to see your doctor and say you've, you've had a faint, um, they will no doubt count your pulse, and if they've got an ECG machine, will do an ECG. That may or may not pick something up, because as the nature has it, you have a symptom, by the time you get to your doctor, you're fine. So it depends on the frequency of uh, the episode, as to whether you're going to catch it when you visit your doctor, or whether you need some other tests. And those tests are normally done at a cardiac centre, and on that basis, the um, centre will give you some recording device to take. Either it'll be attached to you um, with some stickers or it'll be um, on the skin with any um, different type of, of uh, pacemaker, somewhere like an elastoplast with a central uh, recording device like a mini computer and others are several leads attached to a box and that can be kept in some cases for a, more than a week but it becomes a bit uncomfortable if you get much longer than that because of the irritation to the skin. So you can look at the, the rhythm of the heart through this recording, but it doesn't give you everything you need. It doesn't tell you your blood pressure, and it won't tell you at the time if something happens what caused it. So you're normally given a diary to, to carry, and if you have an event, then you write in at the time what happened or what you can recall if you can, or if there's stand, someone standing by, they can tell you what they saw. And they... Um, all have a little button or an activator that you can press so that it will mark the trace where um, the particular events occurred and it will be lined up with the diary to see what's happened. So fainting is, a, is one particular example of why somebody might have a problem that requires a pacemaker but there are other things that can happen. People can just feel generally tired and lethargic and that may be due to a very slow pulse and that is termed heart block if the heart is not sending the signal from the top to the bottom. So by block we mean literally the circuitry between the two, the top here and down these fast fibres fails to conduct. So there's a there's a, a gap in the electrical circuit and that's a block. Other reasons for um, the heart going slow, uh, maybe um, you've got a low thyroid hormone, that doesn't need a pacemaker. So they have to look for non 
uh, uh, pacemaker related causes before you do it to make sure you're not uh, causing the problem uh, that doesn't require a pacemaker. Sometimes people on tablets to dro drop the blood pressure called beta blockers or even people having eye drops with beta blockers in them, they can be absorbed into the circulation and cause a problem with the heart if it's sensitive to that. So you've got a, a problem with someone that's feeling tired and you make sure that it's not a, a, a physical problem, they're not anemic, they haven't got an underactive thyroid etc. And then you put them on to a, a cardiologist who will have a look and see if there's a cardiac cause for it that might warrant a pacemaker. So again the 24-hour tape or the longer recording may pick up if it wasn't picked up on the ECG uh, the heart's going slow and it might be going slow for various reasons we, we've just mentioned. Either the pacemaker's firing slow or the conduction from the top to the bottom of the heart is not working properly. The other use of uh, investigations for working out what's going on with the heart, like an echo or an ultrasound, can be helpful because it can tell you if there's a structural problem with the heart that might be involved with a difficulty in uh, maintaining a normal heartbeat or cardiac output. So if someone's had a heart attack, they might have an enlarged heart with parts that are not moving properly, and others might have a valve problem which can impinge on the circuits of the heart and the damage that's done by the valve over time becoming inflamed and leading to tissues near that heart valve becoming inflamed can again compress or cause damage to the circuits nearby. So we can pick up some structural abnormalities in some people but in many people there isn't anything except the electrical um, problem that occurs. So how, how do you get from a referral to having your pacemaker? Well I thought what I'd do is just show you what some pacemakers look like and explain a bit about them if you haven't seen the video. So in here we have got different different size pacemakers. You can see one here with a, with a lead attached, it's got one lead in it. One here has got two holes if you can see the end and it's got no leads at the moment. And then we've got a rather chunky looking one which has got lots of holes in it. Uh, so uh, this is uh, one that can do much more because it's bigger, it needs a bigger battery, it can defibrillate uh, and shock the heart as well as pace the heart and it can do some other clever things with synchronizing the two chambers, the main left and right ventricle. So you have a pacemaker and you've got to get it to connect to the, the heart. So how's that done? Well you have to get into a vein and this blue one is, a, is the superior vena cava and into that go from under the collarbone, a vein, subclavian, meaning under collarbone, into this. So you can get in by getting through the skin into a vein here or nearer the shoulder, and you pass this wire under sterile conditions, and you have to get it into the heart, and that's done under x ray control. The, uh, the video I showed you earlier, if you have seen it, gave you an example of a lead like this, which has got a flat tip because this one's got a screw in side this and that can be screwed out to screw into muscle. Uh, I use tend to be, be using ones with the little hooks which is like this one and it's got little hooks which you may be able to see here like grappling hooks and you can see those and they're very soft but they will catch on the lining of the heart and over, over time uh, tissue will grow around it and keep it steady in place. So you've got you've got a wire and you can see this little inner wire, this is called a stilet. So for the doctor to be able to get this in the right place, he's got to be able to make this tip go round the corners to the right direction. So by pulling the wire back it's soft, and by pushing it in it's straight, and you can also shape the wire if you want to put a bend on it. So you manipulate this wire into the heart, and uh, if we take another shape, this one is a J wire, a J shape, and that can point upwards, and the importance of that if you saw the video you'll know but if you hadn't you can hook it into the heart and it can be close to the pacemaker cells attached to the lining of the right atrium and sense or pick up any signals that's generating that aren't conducted down to the bottom of the heart or if it does not produce any then this pacemaker which has got a battery in it and ability to listen to the heartbeat it will put one in through a very microscopic electrical current that will come out the tip between the tip, which is a metal bit, and this little ring here. So there's a current that goes between those two in the lining of the heart, and that causes the heart to contract. 
and that will go in the atrium and if you've got another one further down lower down in the heart that's again it's got two poles on it and that's called bipolar pacing so if you need a pacemaker you're going to have a have to have a procedure done under local anesthetic and then you're left with if you get the wires in the heart you've got to connect them up to this pacemaker or generator unit which has got batteries in it highly sophisticated computer uh, algorithms in it or means of watching what's going on electrically and it can record it all and this is obviously sterile in a sterile unit it's done under the sterile conditions in the lab and it has to be put under the skin and in order to do that and when you've got the, the wires connected I'll just get this one here which has got a connection you can imagine you've seen people with a lump maybe a little scar so the pacemaker is sitting under the skin and the wires going through this vein up and round and into the appropriate chamber in the heart there's my t-shirt heart on the heart to heart uh, cartoon I put on this shirt and so you'll have this pacemaker under the skin now the, the procedure itself is not particularly risky if you wanted to know some numbers about one in a hundred can have some sort of complication because you're poking a, a needle into a vessel if you do it too near the lung depending on the technique you use the lung can get a bit of air to leak and that can go down and need a bit longer to heal up so you may stay in overnight but many people now come in on the same day and go home the same day so they have the wires put in under x-ray control you're gowned up with a hat and sterile gown the doctor's gowned up as you see in theatres and they put local anaesthetic to freeze the skin just like the dentist freezes the gum they'll put local anaesthetic under the skin and they'll ask you if you can feel anything you'll feel pushing but it shouldn't be sharp once the needle prickers put the anaesthetic in and wait a minute or two it'll go numb and through that numb patch you can make a little cut and lift the skin up carefully and make a little gap between the fatty layers of the skin and in that you can tuck the pacemaker by then of course it's been connected to the leads and everything's been tested to work and then you seal it up with some stitches and now often we use some glue on the top of the skin and put a plaster over it and normally five days before you can get that wet and when that's taken off there should be a sealed scar and everything should be nice and tidy now the risks of it the one percent apart from the possibility of damaging some tissue locally or the lung or affecting a blood vessel if you if you don't put the needle in the right place or you might cause a nerve to be hit and you might get a bit of a sharp pain it's very rare we get that because we put the local in and we know what the anatomy is the other possibility is infection and you need some antibiotics before the procedure and sometimes we put some in the pocket and that prevents any germs that might have got in despite the sterile technique things floating around the air even if you've got a, a theater which has got negative pressure and everything's filtered and going out rather than in it does reduce the risk or anything getting through the skin despite the, the you know the careful technique we use with gloves etc so that should reduce the risk of infection and the other thing that can happen is you saw those leads are very floppy and they have to fit into the heart and they have to rest on the grooves if they're the ordinary one with the little hooks and not move so when we put the into the heart we do a test get you to cough take a deep breath and we see if it's still pacing the heart at a certain amount of voltage that's acceptable and if it moves and it loses the pacing uh, ability on that we have to move it to somewhere else uh, occasionally we can't get it to sit still and we use a screwing lead some people always use a screw and lead I tend not to unless there's been a, a good reason to and once the, the pacemaker leads in and you've sewn up of course you're relying on your technique and on the table to have proved that it's stable but just a few patients go back to their bed overnight and in the morning it's moved so you, you, you are stuck with one or two like that if it's not screwed in and they may have to come back you know to fiddle the wire open the pocket and reposition it or change it if you really can't get it in a stable position so infection possibility of bruising or damaging any local structures and possibly of the um, pacemaker leads moving uh, in that one to two percent risk now of course once you've got this pacemaker in depending on its size and how well it's made there's only a limited amount of battery power you can have obviously a bigger one will have a bigger battery but of course it may be doing more so how long do they last if you need a pacemaker well a pacemaker nowadays can last six to ten years if you're not using it all the time it'll last longer if you're using it all the time obviously it will use up more energy and last le less time so what the pacemaker is doing in someone with heart block which has got no conduction is all the time listening to the top and bottom of the heart if you've got two leads and it's pacing in synchrony and then it's giving you two chambers 
and the rest of the heart moving as it should do at the right rate. But that's not all it has to do, because if you get up and run around or do something, normally your heart rate would speed up. And if you count your pulse and you go for a walk up and down the stairs or go for a jog and come back, you count your pulse again, you'll notice it's much faster. So how does this pacemaker know when to speed up? Well, within the pacemaker itself, there's different types of sensors. Often it's a vibration sensor that senses you're moving. Others have other biological sensors uh, that can pick up changes in the blood, which reflect uh, changes in your physical activity. Um, they're less, less likely to be used. Um, mostly it's the vibration side. And you can set the speed at which it increases the heart rate against your activity, and, and you can adjust it to suit the person. Now, some people's pacemakers work for ages on two leads, and then at some point, the atrium, as you get older, or for disease reasons later, might stop sending signals in the normal way and they may develop atrial fibrillation and then this lead can't sense and pace because it's going very fast at 300 a minute so it knows that's going on and it will switch off that lead and it'll just pace the bottom of the heart and if the heart flips back into normal rhythm it'll sense that and it'll pace the heart in the, in the two lead method or dual chamber and that's called mode switching but occasionally we have patients that start with fibrillation and there's no point putting two leads in particularly in the older population where maybe less active and you just want something to be there as a backup if they're having intermittent heart block pauses or if they're particularly active and you can't make the top of the chamber reset to sinus rhythm, you'll put a pacemaker in with the same sensors in it that'll speed them up as they do activity. So it gives them an increase in their cardiac output. So that why you have that pacemaker is to make you feel better in some cases. If you're tired because your heart's running slow, it can save you from falling and injuring yourself. If you're having episodes where your heart goes into heart block and you have long segments where your heart's doing nothing, and that's why people faint, it'll come in and pace until the heart picks up or continue pacing if it doesn't, as long as necessary. So the pacemaker is put in because we believe it's going to make you feel better or prevent injury or prevent heart failure, uh, which is another cause uh, uh, or reason for having a pacemaker. And those with heart failure maybe have had a big heart attack or they've had a muscle disease called cardiomyopathy, which may have been inherited, or it may be muscle disease that's come from a heart attack, and that's led to the heart not pumping properly. And I think I did mention on one of my Facebook Lives and in a video that if these two halves aren't pumping normally together, there's competition with the middle section between the two ventricles, and one's pumping a bit earlier than the other, and they sort of compete with each other. So an extra lead in each ventricle can make them fire at the same time. That, that's a biventricular pacemaker. And some of those also have the facility, the heart goes very fast and fibrillates, or has tachycardia, to correct that by either shocking the heart, or from the computer um, program in it, it can actually speed up to overtake the heartbeat and slow it down again. So pacemakers can be very, very technically complicated, but the principle of putting them in is the same. It takes maybe between 20 minutes and an hour, depending on the type of pacemaker, whether it's one or two leads. It's a really complex lead uh, with three leads for um, synchronizing the heart. That can take a couple of hours in some people. But most pacemakers, you come in on the day, you have your uh, pre-med, if you're having a pre-med, you have your local anesthetic and antibiotics, and then you hope to be in and out the catheter lab uh, within a short period of time. And that would mean that you can either go home that evening or in many cases you'll be put in a bed overnight and that bed will uh, just be there to monitor you. And in the morning you'll have a chest x-ray to see that the lungs are right. You'll have a chest x-ray because we can see a starting position of the leads for future reference. And then a pacemaker check will be done through the skin. So what can be done is the um, analyzer that is attached to another computer is put over this site and it's used to read the pacemaker and also send signals to adjust it. And that's what's done once the pacemaker's in, of course. When we test it, once your pocket has been made and the stitch has been put there, pacemaker analyzer is put over the top with a sterile um, technique initially. And then once you've, everything's finished, you've got the bandage on, it can be analyzed with an ordinary pacing check. And if your first check is about six weeks, 
and then yearly if everything's fine. And as you get closer to the end of the battery life, it knows and it tells the pacing technician you need to come earlier, six months, or how many years are expected left in the pacemaker worked out from its use. And you come a bit more frequently and then you get booked in for a change of battery or a box change as we call them. So that's about a pacemaker, some general ideas about why you might have one, a bit about the risks of having a pacemaker, and if anybody feels that uh, they haven't got information from this brief talk, you can try and look at my pacemaker recorded video on how it's done and send some questions in, which I'll be more than happy to answer um, by writing back on either the uh, messenger side of Facebook or um, putting it through the Facebook page directly if you've got a general question in the group. So I'm hoping that this has been useful for those that either had a pacemaker and didn't realise what had actually happened to them and why, or those that might be getting a pacemaker and have an idea of what it might be involved. So looking forward to hearing something from you all and I'll wish you the best of uh, the rest of the evening. We've done just under 25 minutes, so I think that's long enough within the half hour and I'll wish you good night till the next one. Bye-bye.